At World Relief, I am a volunteer coordinator, so I get to work recruiting, training, and supporting volunteers in um, a lot of different roles, a lot of those being one-on-one -on -one relational roles. So we have youth tutors supporting kids with homework, um, ESL tutors meeting one-on-one -on -one to practice conversational English and things like that. Uh, a little bit about my personal background that's, that's relevant to this. Um, so I am not an immigrant myself, don't have that personal lived experience. Um, but I grew up outside of the US in um, India and then partly in Malaysia. And so engaging with uh, different cultures and exploring what it looks like to connect across cultures and to understand my own cultural identity has been a part of my life from a young age and a big part of my motivation um, to be a part of this work and to be a part of um, supporting families and individuals as they're on a journey um, to finding home in a new cultural context. So that's a little bit about me. There's a lot that I'm hoping to cover today. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen and give you a bit of a map of what we're going to do. And I'm going to All right. Get us into presentation mode. All right, can you all see that? Great. All right, so what I'm hoping to do today, we're gonna to start with just really big picture thinking about the terms refugee, asylee, and immigrant, um, and sort of understanding a little bit of the immigration context, a tiny, tiny little um, view of the legal side of that. Then we're gonna go um, a little bit more broader in terms of looking globally at the current um, global refugee crisis and the crisis of displacement around the world, and both look at some numbers with that and also look at um, some stories of how that plays out and how that affects families and then come a little bit closer to home um, and consider the implications on the experience, uh, um, the implications of the experience of displacement on specifically families and children. Um, and so thinking of students that you're working with, students that are in your school. And then we're gonna end by um, reflecting a bit on how you can be a part of that story as an educator. All right. So first, um, what, what are the differences between these terms here? Since we have a larger group, and since I am gonna go quickly through this beginning part, I'm not gonna um, to take time to, to hear your thoughts, but go ahead and, and think um, for a second. How would you describe the difference between the term refugee, the term asylee, the term immigrant? When I ask this question, what usually comes up is the recognition that refugees are people who have had to migrate because they're fleeing something, danger, um, because they're fleeing war or persecution. Um, and the other thing that people say um, is that as an immigrant, you are moving by choice. So there's definitely, there's definitely truth there. Refugees are people who have to migrate because they're fleeing persecution, war, or violence. Um, the thing that's tricky is and important to recognize is that the term immigrant is a really broad umbrella term. And so that includes refugees. That includes people who have to flee because of really severe circumstances. It includes people who move, who relocate in order to pursue economic or educational opportunities. It includes people who move to, um, to be near family or um, just to explore a new place. Um, but usually relocation is hard. And so usually people are moving because there's some strong impetus. Um, the other thing to recognize with these terms is that while refugee broadly refers to anybody who has to move because they're fleeing persecution, war, or violence, um, refugee is also a status. It's a thing that you gain from the UN, um, from an international agency, that allows you to relocate. And so that's something that not everybody has equal access to. You might be fleeing persecution, war, or violence, and there's a pathway 
um, there's a UNHCR office that you can go to and you can apply and you can get a card that says you're a refugee and then you can apply for resettlement and there's a pathway for that. In other places, um, there might be similar levels of violence, but there's not a pathway for that. And so that motivates um, immigration that is very much um, fueled by the same factors, but where there isn't the same pathway. And so that brings us to these terms, asylum seeker and asylee. So an asylum seeker is somebody who is basically in that, in that general category of refugee, but who doesn't have access to that legal pathway to become a refugee through the UNHCR and apply for resettlement and um, relocate through that process. And so an asylum seeker, someone who does that themselves, who gets to a country that they're hoping to resettle in. Um, so a number of countries around the world, the US is one of them, have signed on to an agreement where we recognize the right um, of individuals to seek safety. And so that means when somebody shows up at a port of entry, at a border, at an airport, and they say, I'm here because I'm fleeing um, danger, uh, we as a country will welcome them and will give them the chance to, to prove their case and to stay here as an asylee. Um, so that's a little bit less well known and is helpful to realize that there are people in very similar situations who might be coming through different legal processes. All right, we're going to jump ahead because we talked through all of that and just touch quickly on the number of people that this affects worldwide. So these numbers um, are actually 2019 um, numbers, so they're getting a little bit old. Um, but in 2019, around the world globally, there were 70 million, 70.8 million forcibly displaced people. Um, and so you'll see that includes refugees. So those would be people who are registered with the UNHCR as refugees. That includes asylees. And so that would refer to people who have gotten to a new country, who have gone through that process and who have been granted that status um, in that country. And then that includes, you can see the largest um, number is internally displaced people, which refers to people who are still within their country of origin, but are displaced by, by violence. Um, so it's a really huge number. It's, it's a huge crisis um, in the world today. And the numbers of people being resettled in countries um, through resettlement processes like the US has um, is very small in comparison to this number, currently less than 1% of refugees, so just of that 25.9 million number there, um, have access to resettlement. So are able to move to a new country and settle there and set up a new stable life. A little bit about what this looks like for the US in particular, because those numbers were worldwide. So when somebody is coming through the US refugee resettlement program, what does that look like? What steps do they go through? How long does it take? On average, takes between 18 months to three years, but that's on average. It can take much longer. Um, if issues come up along the way, yeah, I mean, it can take 10, 15 years. Um, so 18 months is on the shorter end. So the first step, as I mentioned, is to gain refugee status with the UNHCR. Um, and then the UNHCR refers you as a refugee to a country for resettlement. Generally, that's not something that you have a say in. The only factor would be if, um, if you do have a family member in a certain country, um, that, might, that might be factored in, um, hopefully, into you uh, being able to reunite with them in that country. So then if the UNHCR refers you to the US, first step is a security process or a security clearance. So that is a security check run through multiple agencies. Um, Following that, a uh, similar clearance is run through the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and then you're matched with, oh, sorry, I'm jumping around here. Um, security clearance interview, missed that one. Um, so that is with a DHS, Department of Homeland Security officer. Um, and you often have to wait quite a while for that. So this is where that can get caught up. Um, you receive that approval, do a medical screening, another, another place where there's potential 
um, for this to, to get cut off if you don't pass that. And so that would be a screening for um, things like TB and um, those are generally the things that are being looked for. Um, once you pass that, you've sort of passed most of the, um, the places where, where your process might get interrupted. And so then you're matched with a sponsor organization such as World Relief. There are nine such organizations in the US and the refugee resettlement process in the US um, does involve everybody being matched with an organization to help them through transition once they arrive. Some cultural orientation is provided. Usually it's pretty, pretty short um, and minimal. It's a pretty cursory overview just of like, what is it gonna look like to get onto a plane and fly to the US and what does the US look like, things like that. And then right before departure, another security clearance, um, another security check is run and then you're on a plane and um, arriving in the US. A look at numbers in the US, I mentioned that um, in comparison to the number of people worldwide who are displaced, um, it's a very small percentage that are resettled. So you'll see from the beginning of the US refugee resettlement program in the early 80s, um, the general trend has been those, the, the refugee ceiling, the number that we welcome, um, being lowered. So we started at, at the highest we've ever been at, um, 200,000. And in the past couple of years, we've seen a, a pretty dramatic um, reduction in the numbers of refugees arriving um, with the lowest uh, in 2020 um, being 15,000. Um, so, but we are expecting um, that to increase. This year is, is gonna be an interesting year in terms of resettlement. Um, there's indication that, that the number will be set higher. That is a presidentially determined number and set each year. Um, and so that means there's a lot of work for organizations and also for communities um, to do in, in being prepared to welcome um, larger numbers of refugees. All right, we're gonna shift a little bit to looking at a specific example of a community um, being affected by mass displacement. Um, and I'm gonna share about a community that I have a little bit more of a personal connection to. So I mentioned I spent some time in Malaysia and while there, I got connected to a community of displaced people from the country of Myanmar called the Rohingya people. Um, so the Rohingya people have been experiencing persecution in their country of origin in Myanmar for many years. And um, people have been fleeing primarily to Bangladesh, which neighbors Myanmar. So Myanmar is the blue um, country right here and Bangladesh is this yellow country here. Um, and then also fleeing by boat to Malaysia, this other blue country down here um, and through Thailand sometimes. And so um, a little bit about what that has looked like um, and it's, it's situations like this that, that often um, cause mass displacement. So the Rohingya people um, have been in Myanmar for decades and, um, and possibly for, for centuries. Um, they are a religious and ethnic minority. Um, so they are um, religiously Muslim um, and the, the majority religion in Myanmar is Buddhism. And um, the origin of, of the people, um, they migrated from Bangladesh in the early 1900s during the British Empire when this whole region was part of, was under British control and, and part of one empire. Um, and so when Myanmar gained independence um, from, from that point, from Myanmar's independence in around 1950, this people group um, was marginalized from the beginning. So they were excluded um, from the constitution, they were excluded from citizenship laws um, and so experienced persecution through um, legal determinations that restricted their rights, restricted um, their mobility. Um, they're limited to a certain area of the country and are required to gain permission to travel further, um, required to gain permission to marry or to build new buildings, especially mosques. Um, and so just life in um, being able to, to function as a community um, has been restricted. And then through the years, 
through through various um, anti illegal immigration acts um, because the the government of Myanmar has often um, portrayed this community as um, illegal immigrants from Bangladesh um, due to their cultural ties to that country and um, and origins historically from that region um, have, have used that as a way to, uh, to disclude them. Um, and so through some of those different um, uh, attempts by the government to, to alienate them, there have been more severe forms of persecution. So land seizure, um, torture, rape, um, and, and killing, mass killing of people. And so there have been different waves of that uh, since since the 1950s and um, the community has moved to Bangladesh and moved back to Myanmar and migrated and returned. Um, but the most recent wave in, in 2017, there was a, um, quite a significant attack on the community and so many people um, fled during that time. So um, as I mentioned, this is instability that has um, been in place for this community for for years. Um, and so when you think about this, um, in, in a situation like this, it's something that's affecting generations and it's something that's affecting family cultures um, in, in a pretty deep and long-term way. There would be different situations around the world, of course, um, and some, some of the situations causing people to flee are, are newer. You know, it's, it's a war that has just come up. And so life was pretty normal until just a few years ago. Um, but in a lot of cases, um, refugees are coming from years of instability or of displacement. Um, so thinking through a little bit of what that might look like and what that might um, mean for a family, I'm going to look at, um, I'm going to look at a video that gives us a glimpse into a school in a refugee camp. So um, those from this community who fled, who flee to uh, Bangladesh, mostly, uh, mostly stay in refugee camps in Bangladesh. Um, those who flee to Malaysia are generally in urban settings, just living in, in cities. Um, but the majority of the, the people fleeing the situation are in camps. And that can be um, a lot of times People will be there for, for years. That's not a very short-term situation. Again, just because resettlement is, um, is, is very limited. So to get an idea of what life looks like in the meantime, and particularly education, I'm gonna switch over. And I think I'm gonna need to stop sharing and reshare. And make sure I have share sound. Are you able to hear that or not? Not quite sure if I successfully shared the sound. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I can't hear the sound. I, was I can't say, neither can I. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So sorry. I thought I got a guess. Um, all right. But I went to the share sound. Let me try again. Thank you for letting me know. I played a couple. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Study through song. A choral drill is a daily ritual for thousands of Rohingya refugee students. Shaika is nine. This is her first classroom ever.
29 of the 40 students here, aged 6 to 11, never went to school in Myanmar. In exile in Bangladesh, they now have a chance. More than 250 learning spaces supported by UNHCR have been set up in the refugee settlements. Roxana teaches English. But the challenge is to turn simple lessons into a lasting education. Primary students get only two hours of informal schooling per day without a certified curriculum or distinct grade levels. And even with three shifts a day, there are still too few spots, especially for older children. Shaika's older brother and sisters, aged 12 to 15, are among those left behind. <laughs> Education is more than formal lessons. It is an opportunity for healing and play. Do you like school? It is an investment in the future and a way to impact the fate of the nearly one million Rohingyas in exile. In education, what we have seen is really ad hoc schools that teach kids a, you know, a little bit of this and that without a proper curriculum. That's not proper education. So if we don't, if we don't structure that properly, uh, in a manner that is standardized and offers proper curriculum to all children, primary and secondary, you really lose, risk losing big time on, on, on a generation of children. Rohingya families know the value of education. They gave their learning center its name. Bororalo means sunrise. And like a new dawn, it holds the promise of all the future can be. Right. Um, so I want to move now into thinking, thinking about coming from these contexts and these situations, what integration into life in the U.S. Um, would look like. Oh, sorry. Still playing. Um, for a student and for a family. And so I want to take a minute. Um, you know, there are lots of you on the call, but if you want to just type into the chat, thinking through some of the things that we've heard, thinking about um, the experience of of instability and displacement for many years, life in camps for many years, um, access to education as described in this video. Um, what are some of the, the challenges that you expect would be a part of adjusting to life more generally or school more specifically in the US? So just put your thoughts in the chat. Or if you want to unmute yourself and share, you're also welcome to do that. Yeah, so the, the reality that there's not a choice um, in where you're relocated mm -hmm. and thinking through all that that comes with that then as well. Um, you know, there's there's a loss of autonomy. There's maybe a, you know, a lack of, you can't choose a place that's more familiar. Language barriers, financial obstacles, um, mm -hmm. transportation background is very diff different. Yeah, and if anyone wants to expound on that, what, you know, what types of background, background in what areas, language barriers, faster paced schedule, um, process of registering, routine and length of a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you guys are definitely um, leaving family behind. Yeah, you guys are definitely hitting on a lot of the things I'm sure aware of, of working with students. Um, so let's Let's go ahead, um, continue, and we're gonna explore some of those things a little bit more in depth, um, but it's great to hear the things that are already on your minds. All right. Sorry, it takes me a second to... Okay, um, 
Yeah, so as, as mentioned in the chat, um, just coming from a context where you've, you've experienced interrupted education. Um, and so, you know, you have, like was described in this video, a little bit, a smattering of things, um, but not a solid foundation. Learning in a new language. Um, and then home support. A couple of you mentioned financial struggles or poverty continuing. Um, and thinking through how, especially when this is a situation that has been affecting communities for generations, you know, that's affected parents' access to education, that's affected parents' access to um, even employment in a lot of cases. Um, in a lot of cases, if you're in a camp for years, you're not able to work. And so then the employment opportunities available to parents in the U.S. are going to be limited. Um, and so there might continue to be financial strain. There, there likely will continue um, to be strain on, on parents in terms of the time that they have to give to their kids. Um, and then also um, the confidence that they have to, to assist with academic work um, and especially work in English. Things you're thinking through. Some of the things that are initially um, you know, a part of culture shock and transition, several of you mentioned them as well, longer school days, different routines, um, something that, that several families um, that, that we've worked with here have encountered is kids just not knowing how to, how to get lunch at school. And, you know, it's been an experience where um, sometimes it takes a couple of weeks, we think everything's good, and then we realize the child hasn't been eating lunch um, because there's just a lot of new things to navigate. Um, there's also a lot of things, and, and I'm sure you noticed in the video, um, in terms of educational um, approaches. Um, so, you know, how, how the students were learning. It was through a lot of um, rote memorization, a lot of just being presented with, you know, here's the alphabet, let's sing it through. Um, not as much individual engagement, not as much um, critical engagement, and so different approaches to education that kids are needing to adjust to. All right. Um, there's also, and this was mentioned, uh, a lot of deeper level um, trauma, grief, and loss uh, that students and their families are dealing with. And so that might be anything from processing really horrific situations um, for students coming from war or coming from violence or coming from um, having endured traumatic journeys where they were in the hands of smugglers um, and had limited food for several days on end. Um, or it might be the trauma of just of leaving home and community and family. And when I say just, but that's not insignificant. You know, that's, that's a huge loss and a huge thing. Um, there's one resource that I would recommend to you and I'll um, share this at the end, but is a collection of poems written by students who are refugees or immigrants themselves. And um, a lot of the poems are just processing um, their experiences. And so there's one that I want to share that particularly dives into um, one student's experience processing some of her trauma. So uh, Shukri Rezai, a 15 year old uh, student. I can't write about my Hazara people who have suffered for decades in Afghanistan where they come from in Pakistan, where they are murdered, in Iran, where they offend because of their almond-shaped eyes. My mind is blank. I can't write about how loud the shooting was, just two miles from my home, how my aunt fainted, how, my ner how nervous my mom got, how the cup fell from her hand. I can't write about how innocent people died, how the martyr's necropolis gets bigger and bigger, how my people suffer, how cruel this world can get, how frightening it is for kids like me. Um, so it might be something really heavy um, like that that kids are, are needing to process. Um, it might be, yeah, just missing a home, missing a loved one. Um, and for, for a lot of families when they've um, been in unstable situations for a while, you know, it's not until they've reached this point where there's some amount of stability, there's some amount of safety um, that there is opportunity to process these things. Um, but it's also the case that, of course, each family um, is going to approach that, that processing very differently and different cultures approach it very differently. And, um, you know, in this case, the student had the opportunity to do that through poetry, 
um, student might not be ready to do that, but there's a lot of things that can be under the surface there. Um, and then just recognizing the different types of things that might, that might trigger um, some of that trauma. And this can be um, a little bit maybe overwhelming to think about, but I think it's important for us to keep in mind um, that when students are, have trauma in their background or have loss in their background, it can be something as simple as, you know, asking about their family that maybe brings up um, the loss of a loved one, like something like how many siblings do you have, or do you have aunts and uncles, or what's a favorite memory from, um, from being with your relatives when you were a child that might be a complicated um, emotional history. Um, or for a lot of students, things like fire alarms or tornado alarms um, are just triggering, triggering if they've um, experienced traumatic um, things like living through war. But I think particularly, um, yeah, as, as adults interacting with students, just thinking through and being ready to be, to be sensitive to um, the ways that questions might bring up things from their past. All right, we talked a little bit already about um, cultural differences, but just to expound on some of those a little bit more, some things that are trends that we see um, across a lot of cultures, ways that, that education particularly um, tends to, to vary from American culture. The US is unique. Um, somewhat unique in our focus on um, really critical engagement, encouraging critical thinking in a lot of cultural contexts. The approach to learning is much more rote. Um, an example of how that might play out, for example, growing up um, in India, uh, the educational system in India does, does have much more of a value on rote memorization. And so that, um, to the extent that, for example, if you are, um, if you're taking a test and uh, on the test, a question is asked, like give an example of a mammal. If in the textbook, the example of the mammal was a horse, then that's the example you need to put. And so it's very copy paste, very, this is what the book says, this is what I put. Um, and so adjusting to, in the US, being asked a lot of, um, you know, what's, what's your idea? What's, um, you know, what do you think? What do you want to put? That might be new for, um, for kids. Um, similarly, a lot of other educational systems place more focus on, um, on exams. And there's a huge, um, the grades are entirely exam based. And so then a lot of pressure on those. And then thinking through um, what, what teacher child and what teacher parent relationships look like. And those having to do with some broader aspects of cultural differences, such as um, how hierarchical versus egalitarian cultures are. So in the US, we're very egalitarian. Um, a lot of cultures swing more um, to be more hierarchical. And so that might mean that a child has been taught um, to not speak unless they're spoken to. And so learning to, to participate, learning to raise their hand and, um, and jump into a conversation might be a new thing also means uh, in a lot of cultures, teachers have a high level of respect. And so parents um, have a lot of trust in teachers and also um, maybe not, not a lot of, not a high comfort level in bringing their suggestions or thoughts, a lot of assumption, um, just that, that the teacher um, knows the best thing and, um, and, and sort of a timidness to, um, to speak into that. Um, and then just some other ways that for children specifically, uh, recognizing that they are often the ones straddling two different cultures in two different worlds. Um, so a small example, but one that, that we've seen come up a lot, and this is an expression of that hierarchical difference. In the US, um, we are very comfortable with eye contact. Um, that's a way to show that we're engaging in a conversation. It's a way to show respect um, and even with children um, and sometimes especially with children, you know, a, a parent might say, look me in the eye, you know, if they're wanting to, to have a conversation with a child. In a lot of other cultures and in particularly in cultures where the honor shame dynamic is more emphasized uh, for a child to make eye contact with an adult 
is, is a really disrespectful thing. It shows that they don't know their place, that they, um, that they don't have a, a proper sense of, um, of humility and of, um, of respect. And so a child growing up between different approaches to that, different assumptions, um, for example, might at school be told and, and learn um, to make eye contact with their teachers and then at home be in trouble for the very same thing. Or at home learn that they need to look down when a parent is talking, when an adult is talking to them and at school be seen as disengaged um, or hard to, hard to connect with. And so children are, are having to bear the burden of um, sorting through those things and learning to operate differently in different settings. Which brings us to the last, um, last thing I wanna to touch on, which is just the identity piece um, for kids growing up uh, as immigrants or as second generation um, immigrants. There, there's a lot of questions around identity. There's a lot of ways in which they're sort of wrestling with where they fit in society, with who they are. Um, this model, third culture kid model suggests that um, students living or children growing up in, um, in communities outside of their parents' home culture um, sort of land in this third cultural category. They don't fit um, in the first culture, their parents' home culture. They don't fit completely in the second culture. Um, they have their own culture. And often that's a culture that they, that they might share with other um, other of their peers who are also, um, you know, in that situation. So it's not that they're completely alone, they share it with some people, um, but it is unique and it's distinct from either um, one or the other. And that makes a lot of relationships um, complicated. That makes relationships with their parents complicated. That, um, that makes relationships with peers complicated. It just means there's a lot more navigating to do. Um, Another book that I would recommend just in thinking through the immigrant experience is The Namesake by Jhumpa Lahiri. You may be familiar with it. And there's a couple of quotes that particularly touch on um, that aspect of an uh, immigrant child's relationship with his parents or family. So this first quote is that um, the book follows a, a family that immigrated from India um, and both kids were born in the U.S. Um, the kids are named Gogol and Sonia. I think their names come up somewhere here. And the parents are Ashok and Ashima. And this first quote is taken from a part in the book when uh, the family goes back to India to visit relatives. And right after they, they arrive in India. Within minutes before their eyes, Ashok and Ashima slip into bolder, less complicated versions of themselves. Their voices louder, their smiles wider, revealing a confidence Gogol and Sonia never see on Pemberton Road, their, their home in Massachusetts. So just recognizing that kids are growing up with a, with a different experience of their parents even, um, with an experience of their parents, again, in some of that, that transition stress that we talked about um, in the challenge of, of processing trauma um, and of, of making ends meet in a new place. Um, and so they're, they're getting sort of a different version of their parents. The second is from a portion of the book where the main character, Gogol, the son, um, is an adult and has sort of moved more into um, the majority culture um, and, and is finding himself, um, yeah, it's placing himself there. So he is uh, dating a white American woman named Maxine and spending a lot of time with her family and her parents, Gerald and Lydia. At times, as the laughter at Gerald and Lydia's table swells and another bottle of wine is opened, Gogol raises his glass to be filled yet again. He is conscious of the fact that his immersion in Maxine's family is a betrayal of his own. Um, so just touching on that, that sense of tension and that sense of, of conflict um, and of feeling the need to choose, which needs me. Um, one model that I have found helpful, and I'm going to land here um, as a way to think about our role, your role um, in students' lives. This looks at what does it, what does it take for um, a community or an individual to integrate in a healthy way into a new society? 
And what is important here is that it points out that yes, developing a positive relationship with the dominant society is one component of that. But the other piece is maintaining a connection to home culture. And especially for children, um, that second piece, that connection to home culture um, is going to be the less intuitive. Kids want to fit in, kids want to um, not, not stand out, not be seen as different or other. Um, and there's a lot just in the world that is communicating to them that whether it's language or um, attitudes or values, you know, that the English is, is the valuable language that, um, that they need to, to see things the way, the way this country and culture do. Um, and so thinking through ways that we can be a part of supporting students um, in, in finding a yes to both of those questions. Some of the ways practically um, that I'm gonna leave you with, I would suggest doing that. Um, really, it requires engaging at a personal level. It requires um, you know, diving into learning about the cultural backgrounds of your students, um, fostering empathy um, for both their experiences of displacement, but also just connection to culture and connection to the rich and beautiful um, sides of their parents' um, heritage and cultural background. Um, the other thing that that is gonna help us do is to recognize cultural biases. Um, and so, because without, without knowing it, you know, we, we, we hold cultural values and that's totally fine. Um, but where those cultural values come into conflict with the values of students' parents, um, what we end up doing then is communicating to them um, that, that the American cultural value is the way things should be and undermining and, and sort of disrupting that connection with home culture. And so be, becoming aware of, um, of our own cultural biases is helpful to avoid doing that. Um, and that leads to the next point of thinking through how to intentionally and proactively include parents. Um, and that I can't, I can't answer for you completely um, and comes with, with challenges of language barriers um, and of some of the cultural things we talked about. Um, but, but pursuing that um, certainly will, will be a part of helping a student to feel that connection. And then lastly, just as you're learning about those diverse cultural backgrounds, you know, including those in conversations. And I think again, the more that a student feels less like there is an either or, less like dominant society is only um, these holidays or this language or these cultural expressions. Um, and so to fit in to dominant society means fitting into those things. Um, the less that will be attention um, and the easier it will be to, um, to, yeah, to have that integration of worlds and integration of, of um, pieces to themselves. All right, so this actually is the final sl slide. I know we're, we're right at 3.30, so I do need to wrap up. I just wanna leave you with some, some reading recommendations. Um, so I mentioned uh, Poems from a School is the collection of poetry by refugee and immigrant youth, the namesake, the book I talked about. And these other two are memoirs of um, refugee students um, that just give a really great glimpse into that experience, particularly um, from the perspective of children. All right, we'll stop sharing. I don't know if, uh, if we have time for questions or if we need to wrap up right now, um, but thank you. Thank you for your attention. I think if anybody had questions and wanted to ask, now would be a good time, if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, would you prefer they just unmute themselves and verbally ask it? Either way, whatever you are comfortable. You can put things in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Okay. Give them a minute or two. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't have a question, but I mm -hmm. do have a comment. Um, uh, there's a couple of graphic novels that are really interesting. I read years ago by Guy mm -hmm. Delisle about the whole, and I think they're called Chronicles of Burma. They're fascinating. Huh. And I think, I think the main character was an American whose wife was a doctor. 
doctor who worked there who was like maybe she was one of those doctors beyond borders or something mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he became the home dad and just how he had to navigate that culture but it opens it opened my eyes to some of the horrible things that were happening to that culture there so it's a they're a fascinating set guy delisle and it's all done in graphic novel excellent excellent um Thank you for the recommendation. And what did you say the, the name of the graphic novels are? They're, um, the, I think the first one was called the Burma Chronicles. Okay. And it's yeah. by Delisle and it's D-E like, and then Lyle the city, I think. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. What are they saying now? Um, I mean, they were saying like by the year 2025, we're going to have a certain percentage of people that were coming from other countries that were immigrants and everything that we're going to have a lot a big influx of you know ELs what is that number now that they're predicting do you know that so I can only speak to and and the only number that is that's very definitely set um, is specifically around refugees um, there, there would be other crit- or ceilings around specific visas, um, but there's not sort of a general like number of immigrants that um, you know that are um, that are permitted to enter each year. But President Biden has indicated that starting so the the fiscal year for refugee admission starts in October. Um, so in this coming fiscal year, the ceiling is supposed to be raised to 125,000. Um, and so that's up from this past year, as I mentioned, it was at 15,000. So a pretty big jump. Um, so that's specifically families coming through the refugee resettlement process. In your, ex- hey, wait, we have a question here in the chat. So I'll just read that aloud and then answer it. In your experience, what immigrant cultures are the most similar and the most dissimilar to American culture? Um, that is a great question. Um, and yeah, uh, hard to answer with with just you know just one or two thoughts, but um, I, because I think there are definitely you no know, different ways in which um, different cultures connect and and don't um, with American culture or are similar or dissimilar. Um, I think hmm, I think I, well I'll speak to um, to cultures that I'm more familiar with. Um, So having more experience with a couple of cultures in Asia, with um, Indian culture and with Malaysian culture and having a lot of friends as well from the Middle East, Afghanistan and Iran. um, I think there are some of the things that are that are more dissimilar, um, especially I'll use the example, um, a lot of of families who um, from Myanmar um, one of the things that's sort of on the surface is just in in initial engaging um, Americans, we tend to be, yeah, we tend to value like open, upfront, and very expressive communication. Um, and in several Southeast Asian cultures, including some of the Burmese cultures that um, that a number of clients come from. Um, there's more reserve um, is, is valued in communication. And so I think that can be a challenge to, to relationship um, because we're expecting sort of a lot of just putting ourselves out there and a lot of openness. Um, and that combined with also our expectations of sort of having strong, strong opinions and a strong sense of self and a strong um, sense of individual identity um, creates, I think, just a challenge in, in connecting. That's something that I've seen at a relational level a lot. Um, yeah, I, yeah, that's a, that's a big, great question. I'm trying to, I'm having a hard time um, thinking through some other shorter ways to, to answer it. I'd love to hear, yeah, your, anyone else, um, anyone else's thoughts on similarities or dissimilarities they've experienced with other cultures as well. Okay, well, thank you so much, Emily. We really appreciate your time and your preparation. I um, think you gave us a lot of good things to think about. Um, yeah, we appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for the work that all of you are doing. Um, yeah.